Okay, here we are. <laughs> All right, so today I'm talking about、uh, the Lord is my shepherd. That is a very famous psalm from the Book of Psalms. Do you guys know who wrote most of the psalms? Who can tell me who wrote most of the psalms? Josh, right? Okay, who wrote most of the psalms? That's right. David wrote most of the psalms. Not all of the psalms, but he wrote most of the psalms. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. What are some smart animals? Now, I'm going to have. I think I have seven pictures of animals up here. So let's see if we can get all seven of them. I looked up on Google. What are the smartest animals? All right. Can you give me one? I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Lucas. Can you give me one smart animal? Elephant. I do have a picture of an elephant up there. Let's see. Gone. Can you give me one smart animal? Oh, and one, one more time. A dolphin. I actually have a picture of a dolphin up there. Let's see.、Uh, um, hmm. Brandon. I do have a picture of an octopus. Let's see. Daniel, right? I don't have a pigeon up there. I do not. I don't think the pigeon is known for its intelligence. Luke, one more time. Actually, yes, you kind of got the trick question.、Uh, JJ,、uh, Luke already said human.、Uh, Grace, monkey. Yes, I do have a monkey up there. But more specifically, there's two kinds of monkeys actually. Biruk, chimpanzee is one, and. I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, white shirt. Yeah, that's right. Daniel. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think you're trying to say orangutan. So we've said chimpanzee, orangutan, dolphin, octopus, elephant. I think I have two more on my list.、Uh, Joseph. Dog. Dog. That's one. And there's one more. Henry. Crow. Crow. Good guess. I didn't have crow. Uh, Shu. Cats are smart. Yes, I have a cat. My cat's not that smart though.、Uh, let's see, Justin. One more time. Hyena. Hyenas are pretty smart, but those aren't the ones that. Josh. Parrots are. Yes,、uh, parrots are quite smart. I probably could have included parrot, but I didn't. You guys might not actually guess the one that I wrote on there. What was that? Yes, pig is the one. Was that where you were going to say, Sophia? I appreciate your honesty and your intelligence.、Uh, so here we have chimpanzee and orangutan. Here we have dolphin and octopus. Here we have an elephant. There's a pig and there's a dog. So we pretty much covered all of the smartest animals. And as it happens, what is the smartest animal? Luke already mentioned that. You and me and every other human, we are the smartest animal. Ha 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 ha. Now, why is the human the smartest animal? That's a little bit of a trickier question. What do you think,、uh, Josh? Right? No, you're not Josh. Lucas. Sorry. That's right. That is the right answer. We are the smartest animal because we are made in God's image. Genesis 1:27 says, "So God created mankind in His own image." In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. So, what makes us special is we are the only animals that are made in God's image. Now, here's what's interesting. What is? What are some unintelligent animals? What are some animals that are not smart? Grace. Actually, you got the right answer. Yes. So Grace was able to see into the future and figure out because she's made in God's image that sheep is the right answer. There are other unintelligent animals. Go ahead and give me one, Brandon. Okay,、uh, she. Go ahead. Okay. How about let's just say you all forgot.、Uh, so my point is, sheep are unintelligent animals. Now here's. Also, what's interesting? So we mentioned some intelligent animals. We mentioned elephants, dolphins, mm, pigs, mm, chimpanzees, orangutans,、mm, and dogs. That's right. Now, in the Bible, are we humans compared to any of those animals? Are we ever compared to 
intelligent, uh, are we ever compared to the intelligent animals we mentioned, like elephants, like dogs, like pigs, or dolphins, or orangutans? No. In fact, most of those animals aren't mentioned in the Bible. You know what animal is mentioned in the Bible a lot? Sheep. So the answer to this question, what kind of animals are humans compared to in the Bible? Sheep. So here are some verses to uh, basically prove to you that in the Bible, we are most often compared to sheep, the animal that's not very smart. So let me go back. This is Isaiah 53, verse 6. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. To go astray means to go where you're not supposed to. So we all have paths that God wants us to follow. In, in JCS, for example, you're supposed to go on the stairs. You're not supposed to take the elevator. But if we act like sheep, we get on the elevator, even though we're not supposed to. Each of us has turned to our own way. Or maybe we just leave the building. We say, you know what? It's lunchtime. I want to go get some McDonald's. So we are like sheep. We go where we want to go, even though that's not where we're supposed to go. Here's another verse, Psalm 100, verse 3. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Now, we already clarified that we are like sheep, and sheep are not intelligent animals. Who here wants to be compared to a sheep? Does anybody want to be called a sheep? Is it a compliment if someone says, you are such a sheep? Wouldn't you rather be called, you know, a smart animal, like you're smart like a dog, or you have a good memory like an elephant, or you communicate well like a dolphin? No, you are a sheep. That's what it says in the Bible. And then in John 10, verse 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Now, here's the question. Why are we compared to sheep if we're also the smartest animal. That's weird, right? God says that we are made in his image and that's what makes us really smart, but we're also compared to sheep. Sheep are not known for being very smart. That's what you might call a paradox or a contradiction. So, we don't resemble sheep in all ways, but there are a few ways that we resemble sheep or we look like sheep because we disobey God and because there are certain ways in, we, in which we fall short of what God wants us to do because we are sinful. So, first of all, sheep are helpless. Sheep are not able to figure out where they're supposed to go on their own. Sheep don't have GPSs to tell them where to go if they get lost. Sheep are also not very good at protecting themselves. If a sheep meets a wolf, is the, sheep going, is the sheep going to be able to defend itself? Not really. The wolf is going to win that fight 10 times out of 10. So sheep are not very smart. Sheep are not able to protect themselves. Sheep get lost easily. And as it turns out, many of those descriptions describe humans. We also get lost easily. We're also unable to protect ourselves from things like diseases, from natural disasters, and we are often also disobedient. What other traits do sheep have? Sheep are not meant to carry burdens. Have you ever seen a person ride a sheep? You have? Who's seen a, a person ride a sheep? Brandon, you've seen a person ride a sheep? I don't believe you. Uh, where did you see this person riding a sheep? Was it at the circus? Maybe in the farm, okay. But in general, sheep are not called beasts of burden. You wouldn't put your suitcases on a sheep. You would rather use a horse or a camel or maybe a cow. Sheep, though, they're not very strong. They're not meant for being beasts of burden. So instead of us carrying our spiritual burden, Jesus carries our burdens for us. Now, lastly, sheep are valuable. Even though this sheep, it doesn't look very intelligent, this sheep is actually very valuable. Sheep provide wool, they provide meat, they provide milk. So even though sheep might not be 
very useful in other ways, useful in the ways that other animals are, sheep can still be quite valuable, and we are each very valuable to God. Now, what does the Lord provide for us because we are sheep? So, as I mentioned, who can tell me the name of the psalm that I said we would read today? Psalm 23. What is the name of this psalm? Can you remember the title of my sermon? The Lord is my shepherd. That's right. So, we're going to read a few verses from Psalm 23. I'll just read it for you. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So in these few verses, we learn that there are a few things that God provides for us because he is our shepherd and we are his sheep. Here's a picture of some cute lambs. So. In those first few verses, it makes it clear that the Lord provides our daily needs. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord also provides rest for us. Now, there are different kinds of rest. It's not just talking about physical rest. It's also talking about spiritual rest. If you're feeling stressed about school, if you're feeling stressed about your relationships with other people, the Lord can provide you with rest. He leads me beside still waters. And then lastly, the Lord provides us with guidance. Where can we find guidance? Where can we find what God wants for us? Where can we find these answers? Does, does, uh, does God give us each a little glass ball that we can rub and it will tell us what we should do? No, does God give us like a deck of cards that if we throw the deck of cards on the table, we'll figure out what God's plan is for us? Now, what does God provide for us? Henry, the Bible. So the God, God provides us with guidance in the Bible. And so that's another version of saying he leads me in paths of righteousness. So we can learn what it looks like to walk in paths of righteousness in the Bible. Here are a few more verses from Psalm 23. Here's the next verse. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now I want to go back a little bit in the first few verses. Now, for those of you who are older students, who have taken English classes for a little bit longer, you may be familiar with what a pronoun is. Now, in this verse, first of all, who knows what a pronoun is? Okay, you're all pretty confident that you know what a pronoun is. Eden, can you give me an example of a pronoun? I. I. That's a good example. What's another pronoun? She. You. you. What's another pronoun? Josh. It. It. That works. Daniel, what's another pronoun? You. you. That, that works as well. What is the most common pronoun in this verse? Shu. He. He. That's right. And he is referring to what God does for us. So in the first few verses, it talks about the things that God does for us. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. But look what happens in verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Does God put us in the valley of the shadow of death? No. This verse makes it clear that we may be in the valley of the shadow of death because of decisions that we make. Does the valley of the shadow of death sound like a good place to be? No. Now, you may, sounds like you guys know what pronouns are, so you might also know what metaphors are. The valley of the shadow of death is metaphorical. The valley of the shadow of death, most of us, unless we go to the army, unless we come like special forces, soldiers or something like that, most of us won't go to valleys where we're faced with actual death. But the valley of the shadow of death may be referring to places where we don't feel God close to us, where we feel distant from God. 
And more often than not, we find ourselves in this valley because of decisions that we've made. Now, what we can take comfort in is knowing that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we don't need to fear evil because God is with us. So in this verse, it makes it clear that the Lord provides comfort and protection. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And God also provides forgiveness. Even though we may end up being in the valley of the shadow of death because of decisions that we make, God provides forgiveness for decisions that we are responsible for. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So, what is the valley of the shadow of death? I already kind of explained it. The valley of the shadow of death is times in our lives when we don't feel close to God. Usually because of decisions, poor decisions that we've made because we have sinned. So, how should we respond when we find ourselves in the valley? And I have three things that you should do if you feel like you are in a valley of the shadow of death. If you feel like you are distant from God, if God is not close to you, if you feel like your relationship with God isn't where it should be. So the first thing you should do is acknowledge where you are or where we are. To acknowledge means to recognize or to know that something is. So many of us might not even realize we're in a valley of the shadow of death. Many of us might think that we're doing fine, but if you aren't spending a lot of time reading the Bible, if you aren't spending a lot of time praying, if you're not going to church regularly, you might actually be in a valley of the shadow of death without even realizing it. So the most important thing you need to do is acknowledge where you are. Once you do recognize that you are in a valley of the shadow of death, you should receive God's help. So, so far I've said you should acknowledge and then you should receive God's help. You, you should ask God to help you out. You should say, God, I want to feel close to you again. Help me to know what I need to do in order to strengthen my relationship with you. And then God may give you the tools or the means of getting out of the valley of the shadow of death. So what should you do? Move. Get going. Get out of the valley of the shadow of death. God will give you the means, the way, to get out of the valley of the shadow of death. So what were the three things you need to do when you are in the valley of the shadow of death? What was the first thing? Grace. Pray. That's not, well, what was the first verb I said? It starts with an A. Matthew. Acknowledge. acknowledge. And then once you acknowledge that you are in the valley, what should you do? What was the second verb I said? Luna. Receive. Receive. And then the third one was, once you have acknowledged that you're in the valley and you've received God's help, what should you do? Sophia. Move. Move. And what do those three verbs spell? Acknowledge, receive, move. The first letters. Arm. Oh, and what does Psalm 136, verse 12 say? It says, with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. For his love, for his steadfast love endures forever. Now that's just a coincidence, but I thought that that would be an easy way to remember what we should do if we find ourselves in the valley of the shadow of death, where we feel distant from God. We should acknowledge that we are in a situation that we shouldn't be in and that we need God's help. And so we should receive God's help and then we should move. We can't just say, Lord, I'm in a bad situation. I expect you to do all the work for me. No, you need to get up and get moving. Let's pray.